Welcome to South Lake Church, a congregation of the Presbyterian Church in America located in Huntersville, North Carolina. Today, Senior Pastor Dan King is preaching from the book of 2 Corinthians in a sermon titled, God's Plan, Our Purpose, Giving. Grace and peace to you all from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome. So very, very glad to be worshiping with you this Lord's Day and Lisa Barna's birthday, by the way. So happy birthday. <laughs> and uh, glad to see some of her flock here uh, worshiping on this uh, special occasion. I wonder what it's like to be born on Halloween. In her case, I think she was certainly a treat and not a trick. October 31st, that means we've come to the end of our month of missions emphasis, and uh, today we're going to be welcoming Andrew Goizueta, who's the Reform University Fellowship uh, pastor at Davidson College. He'll be coming and making a presentation a bit uh, later in the service. Handsome man, smart, devoted to the Lord, wants to make Jesus known and help people grow in Him. Just the kind of fellow that we'd like to have representing us on the campus of an institution like Davidson College. Uh, Andrew is a graduate of Davidson College. Uh, he interned as an RUF uh, intern at uh, Duke University. He's into those private schools, I suppose, for a couple of years, and then went off to seminary, Covenant Theological Seminary, our denominational school in St. Louis, got his Master of Divinity degree and um, was ordained in the Presbyterian Church in America, served I think three years at a church as an assistant pastor down in Greenville, South Carolina, and then was called to come with his wife, wonderful wife Amanda, and their children, Cora and Emma, to uh, fill in behind uh, the good work that Sid Druin had done at, um, at uh, Davidson College. And been there I guess about three years now, right? And he's going to come and give a report later on. This is one of the ministries that you support through your faith promise giving to missionary work. And I love RUF, Reform University Fellowship, because it is not a parachurch organization. We're grateful for parachurch organizations. But this is not alongside the church. This is the church. This is our work on the university and college campus. And uh, we're very, very glad that Andrew represents us so well over there. Well, as I say, this is the, uh, the, the end of our missions emphasis for the month, but I heard, certainly hope not the end of missions emphasis in the life of South Lake Church. A number of you have committed to pray regularly for a missionary in the coming calendar year. Some of you have not. So I want, if you need a card to sign up to pray, raise your hand and uh, Bruce is going to get you one. Some of you who have not signed up yet maybe don't have a card. And by the way, guests and visitors can do this too, and children can do this too. Uh, we are hoping that 50 of us will sign up to pray regularly for a missionary in the year 2022. So far, I think there are 21 of us, which is a great stride ahead from where we've been previously, but we want it to go farther, and everybody can pray. This is a wonderful way for parents to discipline their children in this matter of prayer for missionaries. I like to see families that take a missionary prayer card and put it between the salt and pepper shakers on their dining table, and they can pray with their children at, at mealtime and say, look, here are the missionaries that we're praying for. Andrew Goizetta over at uh, Davidson College, we're praying for him, or whichever one you choose. And when you choose a missionary, you can pick up a prayer card, a reminder card, on the table in the back that has their picture and a sketch of their uh, work there, so you can be reminded and have a better informed view of their work. So everybody uh, should be praying. Later in the service today, you're also going to be called upon to make a commitment to faith, promise, missionary support. This is a means that South Lake chose many years ago to support missionary personnel around the world. This is outside the budget, above and beyond our regular tithes and offerings. And this year we have goals in three tiers. A $35,000 uh, commitment from you would let us maintain the support we're presently uh, doing for our missionaries at this, at this point. If we were to come to uh, $40,000, then we'd be able to enhance the support for the existing missionaries. But if by God's grace He were to enable us to persuade us to commit to $45,000, we could begin to talk about taking on new missionaries. And so in your, in your folder, in your worship bulletin today, you're going to find a, a commitment card for uh, Faith Promise. I want you to look at it now because later in the service I'll be asking you to, to submit it with your Faith Promise commitment. 
I'll be explaining more about faith promise. You can see here there is a portion for you to keep as a reminder. This is effective for the calendar year 2022, by the way. And then a, a, a lower portion that you'll turn in at the end of the service as the deacons come and uh, receive them. So I hope everybody's going to be praying. There's your prayer card. The reminder that you have a prayer uh, card from your missionary that you can put on your refrigerator, on your dining room table, remember to pray. And then coming up later in the service will be your faith promise uh, commitment card. A lot going on, but um, a lot of interest that we have in doing what the Lord would have us to do through praying for missionaries and supporting them through faith promise giving. Tuesday night we have another congregational question and answer period, discussion time about this proposal from the session for the separation of the church and the South Lake Christian Academy. All members are encouraged to be on hand as we continue that discussion that ran for about two hours uh, last Tuesday night. We'll pick up about where we left off and continue uh, as long as you want to talk, not necessarily in one setting, but we've got a couple of three weeks now before any decisions are going to be asked of you. So you be thinking and praying, certainly praying about that very uh, significant uh, decision. But I hope that right now, that's, that's a very big issue, it's an emotional issue, it's occupied a lot of my mind and energy and emotion this past week, I'm sure it has for many of you. Can we put that aside for the moment? Can we just let that rest for the moment and come now to seek the face of God, uh, to, to let Him be the pursuit of our lives, our interest, at least in, in this moment, above all else, to seek the beauty of Christ and uh, the work of His Holy Spirit in our lives to help us live more for Him, um, regardless of what's going on in governance or organization of school or, or church. So hear God's call to worship. Give thanks to the Lord, call on His name, make known among the nations what He has done. Sing to Him, sing praise to Him, tell all of His wonderful acts. Glory in His holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord and His strength. Seek His face always. Let's worship God. Please pray with me. Lord, Your face is wonderful to contemplate. We long for that day when we will see You face to face. You have commanded us to seek Your face, and You have said that when we seek You earnestly, You will be found by us. And so give us the capacity in our hearts and minds and spirits to seek you earnestly. Help us to find you as we come to worship through Christ our Savior by the power of your Spirit. Amen. Please stand.
Please be seated. Our first reading from God's Word this morning comes from Exodus chapter 16. I'll be reading verses 1 through 36. This is the Word of God, which is flawless, like silver, refined in a furnace of clay, purified seven times. Hear His Word. The whole Israelite community set out from Elim and came to the desert of Sin, which is between Elim and Sinai, on the fifteenth day of the second month after they'd come out of Egypt. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you've brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. On the sixth day they are to prepare what they bring in, and that is to be twice as much as they gather on the other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, In the evening you will know that it was the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, and in the morning you will see the glory of the Lord, because He has heard your grumbling against Him. Who are we that you should grumble against us? Moses also said, You will know that it was the Lord when He gives you meat to eat in the evening, and all the bread you want in the morning, because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we? You're not grumbling against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses told Aaron, Say to the entire Israelite community, Come before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. While Aaron was speaking to the whole Israelite community, they looked toward the desert, and there was the glory of the Lord appearing in the cloud. The Lord said to Moses, I've heard the grumbling of the Israelites. Tell them at twilight you will eat meat, and in the morning you will be filled with bread. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. That evening quail came and covered the camp. And in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the dew was gone, then flakes like frost on the ground appeared on the desert floor. When the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, What is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Each one is to gather as much as he needs. Take an omer for each person you have in your tent. The Israelites did as they were told. Some gathered much, some little. And when they measured it by the omer, he who gathered much did not have too much, and he who gathered little did not have too little. Each one gathered as much as he needed. Then Moses said to them, No one is to keep any of it until morning. However, some of them paid no attention to Moses. They kept part of it until morning, but it was full of maggots and began to smell. So Moses was angry with them. Each morning everyone gathered as much as he needed, and when the sun grew hot it melted away. On the sixth day they gathered twice as much, two omers for each person, And the leaders of the community came and reported this to Moses. He said to them, This is what the Lord commanded. Tomorrow is to be a day of rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. So bake what you want to bake, and boil what you want to boil. Save whatever is left, and keep it until morning. So they saved it until morning, as Moses commanded, and it did not stink or get maggots in it. Eat it today, Moses said, because today is a Sabbath to the Lord. You will not find any of it on the ground today. Six days you are to gather it, but on the seventh day, the Sabbath, there will not be any. Nevertheless, some of the people went out on the seventh day to gather it, but they found none. Then the Lord said to Moses, How long will you refuse to keep my commands and my instructions? Bear in mind that the Lord has given you the Sabbath. That is why on the sixth day He gives you bread for two days. Everyone is to stay where he is on the seventh day. No one is to go out. So the people rested on the seventh day. The people of Israel called the bread manna. It was white like coriander seed 
and tasted like wafers made with honey. Moses said, This is what the Lord has commanded. Take an omer of manna and keep it for the generations to come, so they can see the bread I gave you to eat in the desert when I brought you out of Egypt. So Moses said to Aaron, Take a jar and put an omer of manna in it. Then place it before the Lord to be kept for the generations to come. As the Lord commanded Moses, Aaron put the manna in front of the testimony that it might be kept. The Israelites ate manna forty years until they came to a land that was settled. They ate manna until they reached the border of Canaan. An omer is one-tenth of an ephah. This is the Word of God. Let's pray, taking a moment in silence to reflect on God's faithfulness and our unfaithfulness, on His truth speaking and our disobedience to the plainly revealed Word of God. Confess your sins in this regard or any other regard of which the Holy Spirit might convict you in a moment of silence, and then afterward I'll pray our corporate prayer of confession. Let us pray. Father, we come before you as sinners guilty, as the Israelites were guilty, of disbelief, of faithlessness, even in the face of your great faithfulness. Uh, We have not not believed your promises. We have not stood upon the word clearly delivered to us. We have preferred our own ways to your ways. We have thought things too difficult for you to perform. We have devised our own means for our success in this world, and we have turned aside from your ordained means. Lord, we're not much different from these Israelites, basking in your favor and your provision day by day, and yet still worried about tomorrow, seeing your unshakable faithfulness to all that you've proclaimed, and yet worrying about what we'll eat and what we'll drink and what we'll wear. Lord, we have gone just like the pagans after these things. We have not sought first the kingdom of God. We have not given you opportunity to display your faithfulness in the promise that all these other things would be given to us as well. And it rises out of unbelief. Failure to believe that you can be as good as you say you are. Failure to believe that you will be as good tomorrow as you were yesterday. Failure to believe that you take our needs to heart, that you're touched with our griefs, that you are pained with our afflictions, and that you grieve over our desert wanderings. Lord, give us faith to trust you more. Thank you that Jesus has come to be the mediator between sinful people like us and a holy God like you. Thank you that he has come to be the all-sufficient and perfect sacrifice for sinners like us, even with sins as great as ours. Thank you that he has shown us what it looks like for a man who walks this earth to pray, Father, not my will but thine be done, and then to walk in that way. Thank you for Jesus, for all that he is, for all that he means, for all that he has done for us. Help us to follow after him. In his name we pray. Amen. And here's the assurance we have from God himself, the one whom we say we trust and whose word we follow, that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I believe it was uh, the patriarch of the Rockefeller family, the first one who really hit it big. 
And through his business endeavors, he became eventually the richest man in the United States. And he was posed a question by someone. So being the richest man in the United States in history, how much money is enough? And you probably know his answer. He said just a little bit more. And I think like the people of Israel, when God gives us something, even his salvation, we're always looking for a little bit more. We're always reluctant to stay in that Sabbath rest of knowing this is it. There's no more. It's complete. His mercy is full. And to rest in that. That's what we do here today. We confess our sins, but we also acknowledge God has done the complete work. And we can rejoice in that. We can celebrate his great mercy to us and we can share with others. Please stand. Wonderful, merciful Savior, precious Redeemer and friend, who would have thought that love could rescue
Reverend, uh, <coughs> Reverend Andrew Gorzetta, uh, makes it his life's calling to show in a highly academic setting with all of those enticements and uh, fascinating areas of study and knowledge that nothing exceeds the beauty of the Lord. Andrew, come and tell us what's going on with RUF at Davidson College. Welcome. We're so glad that you're here. Thanks, Dan. Thank you, Dan, and thank you, Southlake family. Um, before I give a, a brief update and share a few prayer requests, I just want to say I am impressed um, with Dan's ability to remember even small details about me, where I went to school, uh, um, where I served as an intern, uh, and not so small details about me, my wife's name, my children's name. So, so thank you for, for showing me love uh, in that way. Um, also impressed that you pronounced my last name flawlessly. No, no small feat, um, if I do say so myself. Well, uh, as Dan mentioned, my name is Andrew Goizueta. I'm the campus minister with Reform University Fellowship at Davidson College, my alma mater. Um, this is my third year on campus and so, so grateful to be there and so, so thankful for your support that enables me to be there. Uh, my wife, Amanda, and our two girls, Emma and Cora, wish they could be here this morning, but Amanda has a membership interview at our home church, Harbor, which is a sister church uh, of South Lake, just up the road in Mooresville, uh, but they do send their greetings. Um, yeah, I'll give a few um, short snippet stories of what the semester has looked like as a ministry update, and then I'll share a few prayer requests. And at the very end, I want to share uh, something that Emma, my four-year-old, wanted me to share with y'all. So uh, with that, as an update, as I've reflected on what God's been doing this semester at Davidson, I would say that he has enabled the gospel to go both deeper and wider this semester. And here's what I mean by that. First, the gospel's gone deeper. One of the things that we started this year uh, for the first time, at least as, as long as I've been the campus minister, is a men's only and a women's only small group book discussion. Uh, they meet on Mondays. The guys I lead uh, Monday morning bright and early at 715. And then we have a senior girl named Alexa who leads the women's discussion. And we're going through this book uh, called This is Awkward, uh, How Life's Uncomfortable Moments Open the Door to Intimacy and Connection. And it's actually written by a friend and colleague of mine, Sammy Rhodes, who's the RUF campus minister uh, down the road a ways at USC in South Carolina. And as we've met, uh, at least for the guys, I can say firsthand, we've been able to talk about things in a small group that are hard to talk about. Uh, our families divorce, depression, uh, pornography, things that we don't usually like to talk about uh, openly. And RUF has provided a safe place where young people aged between 18 and 21 can get together and share some of the harder things of life, the uncomfortable things of life. And together we've seen how the gospel of Jesus addresses all those various things. And I would say that it's an opportunity for us, as John says in 1 John chapter 1, to walk in the light as he, God, is in the light, uh, so, that we, so that we would have fellowship with one another and know that the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And we've seen that in really tangible ways, this deeper fellowship, a deeper sense of God's forgiveness um, as we've talked about these uncomfortable moments. So the gospel has gone deeper in the lives of students. It's also spread wider. Uh, more students and more non-Christians have been coming to RUF this semester than in the previous two years. And I, I attribute that in large part to a hunger, a real hunger among young people for a genuine community based in truth and love, especially coming out of this hard season brought on by the pandemic. But I also attribute it to the earnest and faithful efforts of our student leaders, our core group, we call them servant team, our servant leaders, uh, really making an effort to welcome new people into our community and to really make RUF a place of welcome and rest on Davidson's campus. And I want to tell you about one such student that's come this year. I'm going to call him Brad. Uh, he's a sophomore, 
And he shared with me recently that uh, his family, they were uh, Christmas and Easter Christians. And so he doesn't really have that much of a, a faith background. Um, but he's been coming to large group every Tuesday night this semester. And he's hearing the gospel week after week, uh, in large part because one of his best friends is involved in RUF and has faithfully been inviting him back time and time again. And just this past Tuesday evening, uh, I received this text from that friend who keeps inviting Brad. The text said this, Hey, Andrew, just had a really good conversation with Brad about the process of salvation and being in a relationship with Jesus. Could you pray that the Spirit would work in his heart, that he would come to know Jesus personally? And a text like that just reminds me that I have, I think, one of the best jobs in the world, getting to share Jesus with young people and getting to see students, young people, share Jesus with their friends. Uh, it's amazing. God is at work in Brad's life. God's at work in this friend's life, giving him courage and boldness to invite him into relationship with Jesus. As, as C.S. Lewis would say, Aslan is on the move. And that just gives me chills. So I want to leave you with a few prayer requests. Obviously, first and foremost, pray for Brad's salvation. Uh, pray that the Lord would give him a softness of heart. I, I'd love to see him come to Jesus even this semester. Let's pray boldly to that end. Uh, but would you also pray that, that RUF, that that me and my family, that our student leaders, that we wouldn't grow weary or faint-hearted uh, in faithfully sharing the gospel on campus, which I don't think I need to tell you, it can, it can oftentimes be a, a place that's not very open to uh, Orthodox Christian belief. So would you pray that we wouldn't grow weary or faint-hearted? Um, specifically, could you lift up this Tuesday night, uh, we're doing a special large group, it's going to be a Q&A, can I trust the Bible? And so we've uh, started collecting anonymous questions from, from campus and from students, and they've sent in some good ones. <laughs> so would you pray for me as I lead that discussion? Would you pray for the Spirit to be at work um, this Tuesday night for that Can I Trust the Bible session? Uh, just two more prayer requests. Would you pray for the Lord of the harvest to send laborers out into the harvest? Um, I am the only staff member right now at, at RUF at Davidson, and I am going to be applying for interns next year, and I'm actively recruiting a young woman with a seminary degree to come and join alongside me, in particular in discipling the young women uh, at Davidson, which we have plenty that, that are involved in RUF. So would you pray for the Lord to send interns and even uh, a, a campus staff worker um, because there's, there's plenty of labor um, to go around. And then lastly, would you lift up my family? In particular, just our health and safety. Um, I know that's probably on your minds for your own family. As some of you know, my wife Amanda has been dealing with some chronic health issues now for a couple of years. We think it goes back to an early case of COVID, but we can't be sure. Um, but would you pray for her, for her continued uh, recovery and healing? Uh, and then lastly, I told you I would leave you with uh, these words from my daughter, Emma, my four-year-old. I asked them this morning that they weren't sure why I wasn't going to church with, with the family. So I explained that I was coming to talk with you all. And I said, what, what would you like for me to tell them? Like, what, what do you want them to know? And Emma smiled and she said, uh, tell them that I really, really, really love Alexa. And Alexa was that, that uh, student I told you about that's leading the, the women's small group for This Is Awkward. Um, our, our girls, four and three, they adore these college students. And Amanda and I love having them in our home. We're gonna have a group of 12 students tonight for a leadership meeting. Every Sunday night we do that. And um, it's a blessing uh, really to see the students love our daughters and our daughters in turn to, to love them. And whether they realize it or not, they're. Uh, they're ministering to college students. They really are. Um, so thank you uh, for your support. Thank you for your prayers. Uh, thank you um, on behalf of, or as part of our presbytery, for calling me to, to serve the campus at Davidson. Thank you so much. Let me pray for you, Andrew. Uh, Father in heaven, we give you thanks for committed uh, disciples who are disciple makers themselves. 
And so we put uh, the Gorzuetas in that category and give you thanks and praise for them and their desire only to see the glory of Christ and to help others uh, proclaim that glory. We would pray with them for the salvation of Brad and other students who come in contact with the gospel. And that the student ministers themselves, that is the students who are under uh, Andrew's ministry, might uh, be faithful proclaimers and see a great harvest because of their gospel proclamation. We pray that the workers in RUF would not grow weary. Uh, we pray that they would have renewed energy every day and a great uh, renewed vision for what you have called them to do, certainty of that call, and therefore your faithfulness providing for them as they pursue that call. And especially as they confront uh, unbelief and uh, difficult questions about the reliability of Scripture, perhaps the existence of God, God's intentions toward this world. So many questions these inquiring minds want to know, and I pray you'd equip Andrew and others to answer those effectively and well by the work of your Spirit. Bring laborers for the staff, help him to locate the uh, additions that he'd love to see made to the RUF staff at Davidson, interns, and perhaps uh, even full-time workers to focus on the women's ministry. And then do look after his family. Uh, may the doctors get to the bottom of this difficulty with Amanda, or at least cause it to go away, and uh, help them to raise their children loving Jesus, loving the campus, and uh, being in their own little way uh, ambassadors for the gospel in this uh, setting in which you have put them. We pray all this with thanksgiving for all your many blessings. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you, young man. And remember, when you make gifts to Faith Promise for missions, you're supporting the work of Andrew Gozueta and RUF at Davidson and so many other ways that we try to reach out uh, with the gospel. Let's uh, bring our tithes and offerings now to the Lord, and um, let me pray and commit them to, pray, to commit them to the Lord's hand. Father, you're wonderful. Your generous generosity goes beyond all measure. Uh, help us likewise to be generous, uh, to have a heart for the world as you have a heart for the world, Jesus, and as we see our missionaries demonstrate that same heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good to be able to be here and worship with you uh, this morning. Andrew, thank you for your words. Always great to hear from our uh, our missionaries. And uh, I, uh, I get the privilege of, of serving uh, on the RUF committee um, for our presbytery. So I get to, to, uh, to know Andrew a little bit better, and, uh, and he is doing a wonderful job. We're uh, really uh, thankful to be able to hear about the things going on, on campus because it uh, – is so critical in our culture today, the work that you're doing. So thank you for, for sharing with us. Um, and I wanted to uh, also, I know many of y'all have heard uh, already, but um, uh, you're probably aware that Olivia Clark, uh, one of the Clark's uh, daughters, was in a terrible automobile accident. Uh, I guess it was Friday night. Is that right, Dan? Saturday, yeah, Saturday morning, uh, late Friday night. Um, and uh, she had to go into surgery. Um, the surgery was successful uh, as far, but we need to be in prayer for her. Um, 
she is going to, uh, first of all, Mark has, has asked um, that uh, we pray that um, the infection, there's always a concern with the surgery that she had uh, for infection. So we, if we could pray that the infection would hold off and uh, she would recover uh, quickly. Um, I understand there may even have to be some further surgeries. So um, I know that we are a praying people, and that's one of the things I love about our church. And so please, if you would, be in prayer for Olivia and uh, the whole Clark family as they kind of go through that difficult time. Um, and if you would now, let's, uh, let's bow our heads and, and pray. O oh Lord, we praise your holy name, for you are a great God and a great King above all gods. In your hands are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are yours also. The sea is yours, and you made it, and your hands formed the dry land. O oh, let us come and worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for you are the sustainer of life, and you provide for our every need. Knowing our need, and in your great love for us, O oh Lord, you provided your Son, who by his sacrifice on the cross provided a way for us to be restored to you and have eternal life through faith in him. For it is by grace that we are saved through faith and not on our own doing. O oh Lord, we thank you for the gift of your Son and for sending your Holy Spirit to lead us to the truth of your word. Father, I lift up our ministry here at South Lake Church to you. We are thankful that you have blessed this ministry for over 30 years and provided in ways that were often beyond comprehension. We seek your wisdom as we work through the relationship between the church and the academy. Give us clarity in the best way for these ministries to move forward and have the biggest impact on your kingdom. Father, throughout this process, help us to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have called us, with all humility and gentleness and patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in peace. We lift up South Lake Christian Academy to you and pray for the administration, the faculty, and staff, that they would show the students the love of Christ and the hope that can only be found in him. Father, we have many friends and family that are hurting and need your healing hand. We lift up to you, Olivia Clark, that was in this terrible car accident Friday night. We are thankful that, our, that her initial surgery was successful. We ask that you would continue to heal her and that you would keep any infection at bay during this critical time. We ask you to be with the entire Clark family and give them peace I pray for my Aunt Debbie, uh, who was recently diagnosed with colon cancer. We are thankful that it was called early and pray for a successful treatment. And we ask that you continue to be with John and Ginger Wilkie and that you would give them comfort and peace during this difficult time. Father, we continue to lift up our local and foreign missionaries around the world. This week, we lift up the Brookstone School in Charlotte to you. And I pray that you would continue to provide for their needs so they can continue to have an impact on children in the community by providing a Christ-centered education. We also, of course, lift up to you Andrew Goizetta, our RUF minister at Davidson, who spoke with us this morning. May you be with Andrew as he ministers to students at Davidson and seeks to point them to Christ as they navigate an environment that can often be counter to the gospel. Fill him with your spirit, and may his ministry be fruitful. We lift up our country to you, O Lord. We are fortunate to live in a country where we can worship you openly and without fear. Be with our president and our elected officials in Washington, and may their efforts only be successful, only as long as they are in line with your will. We continue to lift up our men and women serving in the military, we thank you for their service and the freedom it provides. We also lift up our police officers, especially our own Matt Ratchford. 
and our first responders that serve in our community and often put themselves in harm's way. May your protection be upon them. And now, Father, I lift up Dan King to you as he preaches your word. I pray that you would open our hearts to hear your message and that we would grow closer to you. Thank you for the gift of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. For it is his name that I pray. Amen. Thank you, Jed. I really love this uh, time of missionaries' in emphasis, whether we call it a conference or a, a month or however we configure it. It gives us a chance to see what God's doing around the world in the particular ministries of those who come and report. But it also helps us remember that we have a part in what God is doing. He has a plan for redemption, and He has condescended. He has stooped low to give us just this unspeakable privilege of having a hand in what He is going to do. And one of the ways that we take a hand in that is through this matter of faith, promise, giving. And that's what I want to speak to you about today. The text we have before us is usually pointed to as the biblical or faith promise missionary giving. So I direct your attention to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. I'm going to read the first seven verses, reminding you that this is the Word of God, which is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It is this which penetrates even to the dividing of soul and spirit and joints and marrow. It is this which judges the thoughts and attitudes of of the heart. Hear the word of God. 2 Corinthians 8, verse 1. And now, brothers, we want you to know of given the Macedonian churches. Out of the most severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able, and even beyond their ability. Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the saints. And they did not do as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us in keeping with God's will. So we urged Titus at a beginning to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But just as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in your love for us. See that you also excel in this grace of giving. Please join me in another word of prayer. Now, Father, we pray that you would come by your Spirit and be our true teacher and guide, so that the words of my mouth, the meditations of all of our hearts, would be found acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength, our rock, and our Redeemer. Amen. I want to focus especially today on uh, verse 3 of the text I've read, for I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. Or if you're looking at King James this morning, you will read these words, for to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power they were willing of themselves. Now here Paul is writing to uh, the church in Corinth. Uh, he is telling them they need to be more like the church in Macedonia, especially in this matter of generosity in the face of adversity, the face of difficulty. Um, Macedonia was that northern portion of Greece. It included places like Philippi and Thessalonica and Berea, some of these churches that we read about in the New Testament. And now, brothers, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. You brothers in Corinth, reflect on the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. Out of the most severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. Now, that's a formula you don't often find. Severe trial plus overflowing joy plus extreme poverty equals rich generosity. It just doesn't make a lot of sense. Macedonia was a favorite battleground of the Roman army. Uh, this place had been decimated by successive wars fought there. And so the poverty that Paul writes about here was a rock-bottom poverty, a hard, war-induced poverty, the kind of thing that we might be looking at today in Afghanistan or in Syria 
or the kind of poverty that faces our brothers and sisters in Christ and all the other residents of this humanitarian crisis in Haiti uh, this morning. Hard, abject poverty. But, Paul says, in the midst of that, in that environment, in that setting, there was this Christian joy. And all of this worked to the welling up of generosity. These people gave to their power, and they gave beyond their power. They gave as much as they were able, and they gave beyond their ability. And here we find the kernel of this idea of faith promise giving for missions. What is faith promise giving? First of all, faith promise giving is giving to the needs of others. It's always outward directed. It's always other directed. This offering was directed to the Christians in Jerusalem, to the needs of the mother church back there. Macedonia was not the only poverty-stricken part of the church in this day. The Christians in the Jewish capital of Jerusalem were persecuted in this era. They were ostracized in this era. It took an economic toll on them in this era. There was a famine beyond this. The church was hurting. They were in poverty. And so the appeal goes out from the mother church, can you help us? What can you do to help us here in our plight in Jerusalem? And so the Macedonian churches had stretched themselves to support those who were living in needy circumstances. These offerings were not for their own needs, although very great they were. These offerings were for the needs of others. God blesses us when we give to the needs of others. God blesses us when we give to the needs of others. It is counterintuitive. It is countercultural. But we're talking about the kingdom of God and His ways, not the kingdom of this world and its ways. Why do we have so much? Why are you and I so richly uh, blessed, so fully endowed to use on ourselves? Is that God's plan? It is not. We are so richly blessed in order that we might have something to give to the needs of others. I'm not making it up. Look ahead to the next chapter of 2 Corinthians Chapter 9, verse 11, what does it say? I've printed it for you on your note-taking sheet. You, you, will be made rich in every way so that, for what purpose? You'll be made rich for the purpose that you can be generous on every occasion. God makes us rich not so that we can lavish these things on ourselves, hoard and spend on ourselves, but so that we can be rich toward others in our generosity uh, toward them. Former Mission to the World coordinator, Dr. Paul Koistra, told me about a fellow named Sundar Singh. Um, he was trekking through the high Himalayas with a traveling companion. And as they went through a certain mountain pass, they came upon a fellow, another traveler, fallen in the snow. And uh, they stopped to look at him. He was in desperate condition. Sundar Singh wanted to help the other fellow did not. The companion wanted to go on. He said, if we stop here now in this weather at this altitude, we're just all going to die. And so he pressed ahead alone. But Sundar Singh bent over and with great effort lifted this half-frozen fellow to his shoulders and with great strain carried him along the way. And pretty soon the warmth of his body began to thaw out this half-frozen fellow. And he revived. And before long, they were walking along together, side by side. When they came upon the companion, the one who had gone ahead alone, he was still alone, but now he was fallen in the snow, and he himself quite dead. What was it Jesus said? For whoever would save his life would lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel, will save it. This is the way of the kingdom. It's not the way of the world, but it is the way of the kingdom. You want to save your life? Bad plan. The Word of God says you will lose it that way. You want to keep your life? The Word of God says, then give it away. You lay up those treasures in heaven. You find eternal riches in glory, and in this world also. Remember what God said in His Word, Whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. And so faith promise is all about sowing generously to meet the needs of others rather than hoarding, 
than taking to ourselves and lavishing the riches that God has given us on ourselves. It's for the needs of others. Secondly, faith promise is giving that is governed by one's ability, but it is not limited to one's ability. It stretches beyond one's ability. Giving that stretches beyond what you're able to give. And so here emerges the element of faith. This is why we call it a faith promise. Now all of us have some ability to give. We could look into our purses or our wallets or our bank accounts and see what we have. We have something that we're able to give. The amount would vary what we, were be, what we would be able to give. Uh, if we had a doctor in the congregation, he probably would be able to give more than the nurse uh, who worked in his office. Their ability to give would be something you could pretty well calculate, just work out on a calculator. What do I have? What can I afford to give? And so it's going to, to vary based on where one is in life. And that kind of giving is good, but that kind of giving doesn't require any particular degree of faith. It just requires a little math to figure out what you got, what you can afford to, to do without, and uh, it can all be run up on a, a calculator. And the Macedonians gave that way. Nothing wrong with giving that way. The Macedonians gave that way. They gave all they were able. But then they went beyond that. When they had given all they were able, the Word of God says they went and gave beyond their ability. After you've given all that you are able, all that you're able to give, how do you give more? You've given all you're able to give before God. This is all I'm able to give. How do you give more? After you've given to your power, how do you give beyond your power? And this is the exciting part to me of faith promise giving because here we pass over from the human to the divine. Here we pass over from the natural to the supernatural. This is why we call it faith promise. Faith promise involves trusting God for an amount that we do not have, for an amount that we do not control, an amount we cannot see and therefore which we must depend upon God to enable us to give. It goes beyond our ability. We often talk about giving all that we can afford. But my dear friends, I say to you, pastorally and lovingly as I can, if you can afford your faith promise commitment, it's probably not a faith promise. It's just a calculation of what you can afford to give. Where's the faith in giving what you already have and already control? Faith promise looks beyond that, reaches out beyond that which we can control, involves things we do not presently have. And so at that point we move beyond our ability and over into God's ability. Now there is a balancing that's required here. I'm not saying you get crazy with this thing. You should not presume upon God. You should not get presumptuous with this thing. Our giving will always be related to our ability. The nurse will probably never give as much as the doctor gave, but through faith, and here's the beauty of it, through faith we are freed from the strict limitations of our ability. Why do you want to limit what God would do? By looking to your own ability rather than His ability. He has the ability to do what? To do anything according to His will. What's the limit of His bank account? What's the limit of His resource? It has no limit. Ours are very definite, very finite, but not God's, not His. And He will give through you if you will allow yourself to become a conduit, if you'll allow yourself to become a channel through which He can pass His resources to His ministry. The Great Commission was His idea, not mine. It wasn't ours. It wasn't the church's. It was His. Nobody wants to see the Great Commission succeed more than God Almighty. Why would we doubt that He would then not supply the resource necessary to bring about that success? It's been my practice as I've been using Faith Promise for many years uh, at the church in Stanley and preaching about it in many other settings that our prayer might be this, and I've printed this even on some of the faith promise cards that I've constructed over the past. A prayer, Lord, for too long I've promised only what I could predict. 
I promise only what I could predict. Open my heart today as I begin to stretch my faith. That's a good prayer. And I hope you'll pray it as you think about your faith promise commitment. So, where have we come thus far? First of all, faith promise is giving to the needs of others. Faith promise is related to our ability, but it goes beyond our ability and causes us to depend on God's ability. And then thirdly, faith promise is not a cash offering, but it involves trusting God over a period of time. Not cash today, but trusting that God would provide over a period of time. When Paul wrote the Corinthians, encouraging, encouraging them in this offering, he said he was going to send along his companion, his protege, Titus, some other brothers that would come and make the arrangement for this uh, Jerusalem offering. Paul himself would come along later and collect the gifts, but now is not the collection time, now is the time of preparation. And so apparently this offering was going to be collected uh, over a period of a year. Now he wanted the Corinthians to begin thinking about it, to begin making plans about it. And no cash was expected now. And so it is today with our appeal to you for faith promise giving. I love the example of this that Paul Smith gave when he was the pastor of the People's Church in Toronto, Canada. He used a little sanctified imagination and he imagined Titus and his companions going through the church rolls at Corinth and then making house calls, visits to the home, knocking on doors and asking people what they were going to do. And so he saw that uh, Titus and his friends might have come to the home of uh, Mr. Jones. Now Mr. Jones was a wheat farmer and they knocked on his door and asked him about an offering and he says, well, uh, the wrong time of the year, fellas. I'm sorry, I don't really have anything to offer at this point. And they said, oh no, you misunderstand. We're not asking for anything today. We want to know what a fellow like you might expect God to provide through him over the next year. What do you think God would provide? He says, oh well, that's, that's a different story. I'll tell you, I, I've got wheat, but that's not the only thing I grow. I also have uh, 10 acres of corn out here on the edge of town. Uh, it's just coming up, but uh, when I harvest that corn, I'll give the proceeds of the sale to this offering. And, and Titus takes out a first century tablet perhaps, not the kind of tablet that you use, but a, a clay tablet perhaps, and a, a stylus, and he writes down Jones, 10 acres of corn. And the fellows have just collected the first faith promise commitment. And they go on their way rejoicing. But what do they have? They just have the expression of the expectation that God would provide Mr. Jones the ability to grow and sell this corn. The corn's just that tall. It's still green. The worms might eat it up. There might be a drought and it dries away. Uh, the bottom might fall out of the market and Mr. Jones not be able to sell the corn. Uh, he may uh, be sick when the harvest time comes, not able to harvest. He may even be dead. Nobody knows what that future is going to hold except God. But what he's saying is, as God enables me, I will give the proceeds from 10 acres of corn to this special offering. Then they come to the home of Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown is a cattle rancher. And they knock and ask about his interest. And he says, well, you, you caught me at a bad time. Uh, I, you know, the market's not till later. I just, I, I don't have anything. I said, oh, we're not looking for anything right now. We're thinking, what would you be able to project that God might enable you to give over the course of the next uh, 12 months? He says, oh, oh, I understand now. He says, well, I tell you, I've got a, a cow out here that's going to have a calf uh, just a few weeks out yet. The calf's not born, but when that calf is born, I'll take it to market and we'll give you the proceeds of that sale. Out comes the stylus and the tablet and they write down brown one calf. But again, the calf's not here. You can't see the calf. The calf might be stillborn. The mother may die before the birth. Again, there may be no market for the calf. Who knows what's going to happen? But what Mr. Brown has said is, as God enables, I will give the proceeds from one calf. And there's a second faith promise made. And the men go on their way uh, rejoicing. They come next to the home of Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith, he's not a cattle rancher. He's not a dirt farmer. He is a big time developer. He's just about finished the new mall over on the east, east side of Corinth. He's got a bid in for the new city subway system. And they knock on his door, ask him. He says, well, I got my money tied up in all these projects. Nothing, nothing I've got to give you. They said, no, sir. They very patiently explain once again, we're not asking for a cash offering. We're asking what you could expect the Lord to provide you to give over the course of a year. And he says, oh, well, I'll tell you what. 
Um, if I don't lose my shirt on this uh, mall development, and if I get that city subway contract, then I'll promise to give 500 denarii. And the men make the record. 500 denarii, Mr. Brown. And off they go rejoicing. But what do they have? They have the promise, 10 acres of corn. They've got the promise, one calf. They've got the promise, 500 denarii. But that's all they've got. The expression of these three men that if, as God enables, when God provides, if God provides, I will give to this, uh, this, this, uh, this, this offering. We look to advance our involvement in faith promise. God's resources are limitless. The question becomes, what can God channel through us? There was a big, uh, big uh, pastor, uh, African-American pastor out on the West Coast, E.V. Hill, who used to preach this, and he'd say, if God can get it through you, God will get it to you. Can God get it through uh, you? The element of faith comes into play. We want to penetrate into our culture, into our world. We do not want to be confined to the four walls of South Lake Church. We want it to be at the Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, uttermost parts of the world, operating at all of those uh, points of interest and involvement. We do that through prayer. I'm com asking you to pray, to commit to pray regularly, but we also do that through faith promise giving. Our church is strong in faith. We want to grow in our faith. This is a way to grow as you see the Lord provide. I could tell you wonderful stories. I won't keep you here long to tell you a lot, lot of stories, but wonderful stories that I've seen over the last 30 years of people who stepped out a little bit in faith and saw the Lord answer that, and then their faith grew and grew and grew. There was a fellow over in Stanley, a fellow never married, took, took care of his elderly mother. We didn't think he had two nickels to rub together. He was in retirement, limited income. He liked to fish and he liked to golf. His name was John. John didn't know about faith promise giving. When we introduced it, he didn't understand what it was. He'd never made one before. He had his card. It was the time to turn in the card. The ushers were coming down the aisles to collect it, and he just wrote in $500 and dropped it in the plate. Didn't know where that was coming from. He went fishing the next week. Crappy tournament up here on Lake Norman. Crappy, that doesn't mean it's a bad tournament. It means that's the kind of <laughs> fish, the kind of fish that they were, they were angling for. And uh, he, got he bought three dozen minnows, went out by himself, fished half a day, all the minnows gone, nothing to show for it. Had one minnow, one minnow left in the bucket. He was ready to go to the, go to the dock. But he said, I might as well fish this minnow too. So he put it on his hook and threw it out as he was kind of trolling back toward the dock. And boom, he, he got a, had a bite. Pulled it in, a little crappy, just about eaten size, as we used to say, just about hand, four fingers. Not, not anything to, to, to get excited about. He was about to throw it back. But he noticed that fish had a tag on its fin. This must be one of the prize fish. Oh. So he goes to the headquarters, the bait shop up there on the highway, and says, I, I got one of these tagged fish. And the man says, yeah, let me look that up. And he looked and said, wait just a minute. I've got to make a phone call. And so he called up the line to the headquarters and said, yeah, it's what I thought. This is a high dollar fish. He thought, well, maybe 50, 100 bucks, 500 bucks. $500. And so the very next Sunday, after making his $500 faith promise commitment, John put a check in the plate for $500, and his faith promise was fulfilled. True story. John lived a few more years, and then he died, and his faith had grown to the place, his appreciation for the cause of the Great Commission had gone to the place that he, except for about $10,000, he gave a cousin or something, he left the entirety of his estate, not a big estate, but more than we thought John ever had, something like $350,000, all to the church with the designation for missions only. And they're still spending his money over there. He's been dead 10 years, I guess. But they're still having a whale of a time, if you'll pardon the fish analogy, spending his money uh, for missions projects. Little faith, God's immediate response, faith grows, 
things grow in the life of the one who is generous and who is trusting the Lord for faith promise. Doesn't always happen that way. Don't, don't let me mislead you. Sometimes it's that, but not, not always. This sort of serendipitous, out of the blue kind of a gift. Some people have faith promise income by simply generating more income. I knew a lady who baked cheesecakes and let her husband take them to the Duke Power office down in Charlotte and sell them. She sold as many as she could bake. Cheesecakes are hard to make, by the way, expensive. But they were snapped up whenever her husband would take them in. Made her faith promise that way. Another guy got a bunch of old computer parts. His uh, company was getting rid of a bunch of obsolete computers. He, he bought them at a, for a song, cannibalized them, put some good workable computers together and sold those to couples. This was back when computers were really expensive. To young couples who couldn't really afford to go to the store and buy a new computer. They were blessed. He got money for faith promise. It was a win-win-win proposition. I've never made extra money for faith promise. I told the Lord one time if he'd help me make a lot of honey with my bees, I'd give that proceeds, those proceeds away, but it didn't work out. My faith promise has come more through the third way, which is simply belt tightening. Looking at your budget, making a few little sacrifices, which aren't really sacrifices in the end, and finding money out of your existing resources uh, to give. Giving up a soda, giving up an, a lunch out, um, not so lavish a vacation, keeping the car for another year, all kinds of ways you can find economy in your own budget. And the Lord has blessed that, and faith has grown. And Carol and I are making, uh, are, are, are um, giving away more in proportion to our income today than we've ever given away. And we have more than we've ever had. God's math is different from man's math. And a little bit of faith will prove it. So I'm going to ask you to pray with me about what God would have you do. This is not what you're able to do but what God would have you do in trusting him to give through you. Do you understand the concept? His resources channeled through you in faith promise. Um, if you're prepared to do that this morning, I'm going to give you a chance to fill out that card. We're going to pray. You can fill it out. If you want to pray about this, think about this a little more. Say, what did that pastor say? Let me think this over a little bit. That's fine. The, 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 the program will be open for several weeks yet. You don't have to do it right now. You might do it now and then think, boy, I should have doubled that. So don't, don't rush into it if you need to wait, okay? But if you are ready, you can mark your card, you tear it in half, you keep to, half to remind you, and you'll put the other half in the offering plate as the, as the ushers come by. Notice your name is not on there. This is anonymous as far as the church is concerned. No one will ever ask you for this. This is not a pledge. I don't even like to use that word pledge because that pledge carries with it the connotation of some kind of legally binding commitment. This is not a legally binding commitment. If your uh, f financial circumstances are not such that you can't keep this, nobody's going to ask you about it. And if the Lord's satisfied, then you should be satisfied. It's between you and Him. It's not between you and me. It's not between you and the church. This is a faith commitment between you and the Lord. <sighs> Any questions? <laughs> Let's pray. And if you're ready to give, please do so. We hope we can make and exceed these goals, but that'll be in the Lord's hands. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your faithfulness to us. You've never let us down. You've never failed us a single time, although we've often failed you. You have promised to bless richly if we would just trust you. We've not always trusted you. Stretch our faith that the passion of your heart, the evangelization of the world, the proclamation of the gospel to all nations might be more rapidly fulfilled as we have this unspeakable privilege of partnering with you in this work that you are determined to do and that you will inevitably do, either with us or without us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We'll sing our closing hymn. The ushers will be available to take your cards. Please stand.
Pastor Goyce, better come and pronounce the benediction for us, would you? Thank you, Dan. It's a joy to worship with you all this morning. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you both right now and forevermore. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Go in peace. Thank you for visiting the South Lake Church YouTube page. More information about our church is available at slchurch.net.